afternoon. I'm just waiting for the panelists to come to the around the table, which is not a table actually. Um, no, maybe I introduce. I, I know the name. Oh, you want me to call the names? So Nicolas Dufourc. <laughs> Welcome, Leila Mamou. Mrs. Naderi Shamlou and Valeria Termini. Valeria Termini should be the fourth panelist. Maybe she will arrive. So, good afternoon. I'm delighted to introduce this round table, which title is The Value of Prosperity for Shared Growth. Let me start with a few opening remarks on Europe which confirm this new optimism which we've been feeling for a few months. You know we've been through terribly, terrible crises and terrible dangers, but er even if everything is not settled, we have now more reasons to hope in Europe's future. First, because the continent is led by a lot of talented men and women and a lot of them are sitting Close. here around this table and in the, in the audience. Then, because uh, Europe is, has now political reasons and economical reasons to be back on the track for prosperity and maybe, hopefully, for a more inclusive prosperity. First good news, the political context. Mr. Tajani uh, was mentioning this context. The populists are not as strong as we were af afraid they could be. Uh, you saw it in a different recent election he mentioned, I do it also because it's very good news in Austria, in Netherlands, in local elections in Germany, and of course we French were very relieved to see that a genuine Europhile came to power. Of course, it's Emmanuel Macron. Another good sign are the last polls. I would just take... Um, the recent one from the Pew Research, which was issued 10 days ago, it showed that, that the British example is frightening the Europeans. Hello, Mrs. Domini. <laughs> uh, the Brexit is considered a nightmare, and the European uh, suddenly realized that stronger, that we are that united, we are stronger, of course. And 77% of the Europeans are against an exit from the EU. So it's a good sign. And last good political sign up to me is a rising success of the pro-Europe demonstration that young people organize every week all over Europe under the logo Pulse of Europe. They're now gathering in 100 towns in 17 countries and saying their love to Europe. And from an economic point of view, we have also a lot of good news. In its spring forecast, the European Commission announced that, I quote, the European economy is showing signs of resilience and that the economic growth is forecasted to continue, which is a wonderful news for us. So some experts even speak from Europhoria. So it's good to hear that. So the timing is perfect to relaunch Europe. Recently, Christine Lagarde, who is a great friend of the Women's Forum, of course, said, globalization needs to have a more inclusive face. So I will copy her and say, Europe needs to have a more inclusive face. How? The four panelists here will give us some examples, some experiences, some suggestions to know how to reach this goal or try to reach it. Let me introduce them to you. I go by the alphabetical order and give you a few hints just to have the official bio and the, the official documents. So, Mrs. on my right, Mrs. Nader Shamlu, uh, you're Iranian. You have a beautiful name, which means a very unique one, Nader. You have um, had a successful career at the World Bank as an economist. You were senior advisor to the chief economist. You focus your research on Middle East and North Africa and published researches which showed how successful and powerful women of this area can be. Today you're very active in NGO and boardrooms. Monsieur Nicolas Dufourc, you're CEO of uh, BPI, uh, La Banque BPI, so the Bank of Public Investment in France. He will explain you how original the business model of his company is. 
He is a real Parisian, which is not uh, very so common. Uh, he has the most brilliant background that French good education can give. And he founded a few tech companies, worked... worked <coughs> sorry? It doesn't work? Yes. So, sorry. You worked as a civil servant. <coughs> What's happening? So you, this is what... Yeah, okay. Worked as a civil servant. It's much better and the counselor um, for French Ministry of uh, Finance and French Ministry of Health, spent also a lot of time at France Telecom and shared its, its famous high-tech daughter company, Wanadu. We have on my right side, uh, Mrs. Mamou, Mamou, Laila Mamou. She explains very often in a very touching way that she comes from a poor family and that she climbed the ladder of success thanks to her work and thanks to her will. And she tries to use our experience to emulate young men and women. And Mrs. Mamou and Mr. Dufour um, will explain us that you can be a banker, but you don't need to be a shark too. Um, and uh, the last person, uh, Valeria Termini, she is the only one who has the luck on this round table to live in Rome though you are traveling a lot for your work. Uh, you are an economist, you teach in Rome, in Cambridge, in London, in New York, so very impressive. You are also a specialist in energy, being a commissioner of the um, Energy Authority of Italy and vice president of the European regulators. So let's start with you, Madame Chamlou. Uh, you will draw us a global picture with facts and figures. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and uh, I want to congratulate Chiara and the Women's Forum for this really wonderful event. It's really uh, wonderful to, to join so many, uh, so many uh, exceptional women. Um, I just wanted to say that we have all in every country come a long way. We are not where we were about 10, 20 years ago, but we are not where we want to be. And I think for, from that perspective, we still have a lot of uh, ground to, to cover. Uh, when I first began to work on gender issues or on women's issues, it was not just on the Middle East, but you know, uh, I focused um, late, later on the Middle East. Everyone thought that the, when, women, when we talk about women's empowerment or women's equality, we have to take away uh, rights from men. And it's uh, that when women win, men must lose, so that there's a zero-sum game that, you know, so there was this, per, this perspective, but I think what has happened in the, in the last, um, certainly since the beginning of this century, I can say the last century's thought was that you, uh, you know, women can only gain at the, at the expense of men, but uh, in the, in the, since 2000, there has been more and more quantitative uh, um, you know, studies done about the cost of inequality, quantifying the cost of inequality for everybody. So what we have, I think, uh, we are now finding ourselves at a, at a stage where, again, the past century's idea was that you educate the women, everything will take care of itself, and that's all that, that needs to be done. But now we are realizing that it's not just enough to educate the women. Still, women will face a lot of barriers, a lot of impediments, and it is important to empower them. That means that taking away those barriers that, are, uh, that hold them back hold back talents, hold back skills that could be contributed to the economy. Now, uh, it is very important to have women in high places, and I have to, to commend that Mrs. Uh, Christine Lagarde has made an incredible contribution to the women's issues because before, let's say again, last century, a lot of economists were very skeptical about women's issues. They thought that this is, you know, a, a soft issue. It has to deal with culture and, you know, religion and so on and so forth. But what Mrs. Lagarde has done is she has brought it into the, like, you know, ground zero of the economic profession. And together with um, Madame Yellen, you know, uh, uh, Janet Yellen of the Federal Reserve, of, of course, of the World Bank, of all of the different organizations, they have commissioned some very, very economically, let's say, academically robust studies that show that women are, you know, very critical. Uh, just to, to mention four uh, small uh, studies, I won't go into great detail, but there is um, one of the 
large, let's say, body of studies deals with income inequality. We've all heard about the 1%, the 99%. It has fed into a lot of populism in, in Europe, in, in America, everywhere else. Well, these studies show that gender inequality is at the center of income inequality. So when countries want to uh, improve the income inequality in their countries instead of taxation, or at least, let's say, let's put it, in addition to taxation or distributional policies, they can also do, uh, by removing barriers from women, they can improve their income inequality you know, con conditions. Um, the other, uh, uh, another study deals with the fact that when women bring their skills and talents to the, to the market, the, the diversification of the economy is so much greater Countries can export, can sell so much more to, to, the, to the outside. Again, women, the gender, in, uh, gender equality is very critical for, you know, industrial diversification. This all leads to the fact that, uh, you know, when women are more uh, in, included in all aspects of decision making of, uh, of um, economic aspects, Companies do better, and I think I don't need to go into details because there, are, there have been so many studies that show that with, uh, when women are at the board, uh, they will, uh, the companies do better in terms of shareholder value, return on equity, all sorts of different uh, indicators that, that there are. Lastly, and here I'd like to, to mention some, some numbers. Uh, lastly, there, there have been a body of studies that show that when women are excluded from the economy, how much the economy loses, uh, or at least when, the, when women are not as included. Uh, for instance, it shows these, these uh, studies show that, for instance, in Italy, if I may use Italy as, as a number, I don't even want to use my own country, Iran, because we, we are sort of like off the chart, if you want to say. But in Italy, if women, if uh, gender, in, uh, if, there were, if there were gender e equality or better gender equality, the Italian economy could be 15% higher. 15% is a lot. That means everybody in this room could have 15% more money, more income, more uh, security. In Germany, it is 10%. In France, it is 9%. In Egypt, it's 29%. Sorry, we are very even behind you in Iran. So that's, uh, if that <laughs> helps. Japan, 15%. So anyway, what I want to say is that we've come a long way. We are now able to quantify uh, the, the cost of gender inequality. We have to do a lot on it. And more and more, we realize how much we need women to be included and involved in all aspects of the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the figures you gave, they concern also GDP? that if women were involved, the GDP of Would these grow. countries could be 15% larger than what it is today. Again, for my own country, it's 38% larger. So I, again, as I said, we are off the chart. But uh, in, in the sense that, you know, yes, if women could contribute as much as they could, I mean, on, let's say, bring it to average uh, number of work days or work hours, we could have that much more growth. There's a lot of hope. I give the floor to Nicolas Dufour and the mic too. So, many, many, many different things to say. First of all, I, I would, of course, um, agree with what you said. I mean, there, there is a study that has been done by, uh, I think it's McKinsey on Europe, that says that uh, if all Europe, only Europe, huh, all European women were as active as the Swedish women, and if all the senior males of Europe were as active as in Hungary, then we would have 3% of GDP growth in Europe every year, which is doubling, just doubling the result of today. Yeah? So the inclusion of women is absolutely fundamental. It's at the heart of the mandate of the bank that I have uh, the uh, honor to lead. Uh, we have um, the duty and, and the pleasure, of course, to finance a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs. And we have to fight against uh, some uh, sort of classical elements of psychology that we, that we find, which are there on the table, that need to be voiced, by which usually the ambition of the business plans which are proposed is lower than the natural ambition of a male business plan, for example. So there is a little bit of cautious that we need to fight. And we do that because the, the nature of the relationship that we entertain with our customers 
is extremely intimate. As we say in French, nous tutoyons les clients, uh, which, which, means that, which, means, which means that uh, we really are trying to live the dream of, of the entrepreneur, she or he, and then to make it happen. And when the dream we feel is half of what it should be, we say it. So basically, a meeting at, the, at BPI France has to go that way, which is we look at, we, we look at, at the plan, at the ambition, and we tell the entrepreneur that we, should, we could probably do twice as much. Twice as much. And, the, and it is specifically true for women. Specifically true for women. Huh? So that... that, that uh, you know, element of fact, because we we've, uh, have objectivized that, we've published, published a lot of studies on the women entrepreneurship and so forth, has to be tackled, per se, uh, and, and, and not, you know, sort of uh, forgotten and, uh, and left behind or aside. So, uh, then, then a point that I have to cite also, because, you know, we're, we're financing 80,000 entrepreneurs, uh, is that we have... Um, uh, a, a policy of uh, gender equality which is affirmed, uh, uh, which is voiced, to the point that when we make an investment, an equity investment in a company, we have that dialogue with the entrepreneur on, uh, you know, what is the proportion of women in the company and so forth, in the executive committee, in the board, in the advisory committee, and uh, we have that discussion. We, we have a, a, a sincere dislike for, um, you know, social uh, comment est-ce qu'on dit ça, la RS, euh, responsabilité sociale d'entreprise hein? CSR. CSR, all right, okay. So, so, so we have, we have, a, we, we have a, an, a, an utter dislike for, I would call it, l'ESR liturgique, which is the, the sort of, you know, uh, read my lips, CSR. Hein? We, 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 we like things which are real, you know, so uh, we, we don't like to tick boxes. Huh? Everything which is uh, just to be a nice pupil uh, with a judge which will give you a good mark, we don't like. What we prefer is to have a real dialogue with the entrepreneur, which is true, sincere. So when there's a real problem of, of uh, inequality in the company, we have just to say to the entrepreneur, you cannot continue like that. You cannot continue like that. Not that we will stop financing you, it's not, it's not the subject. The subject is, as a person, you cannot continue like that. So we, we, are, we, we, we are sort of um, happy and sometimes proud to be a little bit hardcore in that question. Not only, by the way, for gender inequality, but also for environment questions and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the structure of the company, the structure of the governance. And so we, have to, we have to tell the truth to the entrepreneurs. When you finance somebody, you're intimate with that person, you're part of his destiny, you have the right to give a lot of strong messages when necessary. Huh? Um, so... so so we, we, uh, I'd like to close by saying that uh, you know the, the 16 billion euros that we put in the economy every year, they are pushed by that kind of uh, values, moral values, uh, which is the nature of a good relationship with the customer. It is not we are not above, we are not giving lessons. We are we are um, you know at par with the customer and able as a consequence to to voice uh, different things difficult things, intimate things. Huh? At least we try. Um, so this is, um, your model is a kind of best practice or a model. And do you think you can export it? Have you already exported it in other countries? Because it's very specific to France. Is it exportable? Uh, uh, no, actually, so if, if, if I, if I uh, change the nature of the comment on BPI France. What we do on the whole, which is equity, financing through loans, subsidies, grants, soft loans, venture loans, plus coaching a lot of advisory services, plus the export insurance scheme of France, the ECA of France, which here in Italy is called SACE, plus the sovereign fund, all this in an egg totally integrated with 50 branches on the field is unique. 
doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. Huh? There's one country in which there's something which is close to that, which is Canada. The Canadian Development Bank is doing most of what we do, but they don't do the uh, export credit insurance. Huh? So we are the equivalent of the Canadian Development Bank plus the Exim Bank of Canada. But apart from Canada, there is no country in which you have that instrument, which is, which is honestly an extraordinary instrument because it's one stop shopping for the entrepreneur. You know, the entrepreneur goes to his branch in Montpellier, in Strasbourg, in Bourg-en-Bresse, in uh, La Roche-sur-Yon, and he gets it all. So he, to the point that now he doesn't really know precisely what he needs when he comes to us. He comes to have a dialogue, you know, exchange balls, uh, tennis balls, and then and then we refine his needs and, and, and possibly often we're bringing towards a, a path which he had not anticipated. Be it uh, opening, his, opening his capital, uh, doing a venture loan, accepting to enter in one of our schools because we, we now have a, a network of schools for entrepreneurs, you know, sorts of uh, sports centers for those athletes which are the entrepreneurs. We do, we do all this. And we would very, very much like that in Europe other countries uh, copy us, so that we have a network of development banks. We work a lot with Italy, with Casa Depositi, uh, to help uh, Fabio Gallia uh, progressively generate something which looks a little bit like that. Huh? Uh, we work a lot with Scandinavia, because in Scandinavia you have all the bits and pieces that made BPI France, but they have not merged. We work a little bit with, with the British Business Bank, which is very different. And, uh, and that's about it. But, but the dream would be to have, uh, you know, 23 development banks of that kind in Europe. I can tell you that the entrepreneurs of the continent would be uh, much more well off, much better off. And with a, a shared growth, a more inclusive growth, maybe, at the end. I realize, Ms. Mamou, I'm really... Sorry. I'm sorry, I forgot to give your title when I introduced you. I'm sorry, you were so polite, you didn't see anything, say anything. So you're a CEO too, a banker too, and uh, you're one of the most powerful women in Morocco. You're um, leading uh, Wafa Salaf company, uh, which is a leading consumer credit company in Morocco. And uh, knowing that Wafa Salaf means faith and credit, and uh, you too, um, uh, embody this idea that a banker uh, doesn't always go with greed. Explain us, please. Thank you, thank you, Kiara, for inviting me. I'm very, it's very ple pleasure for me to be here, and uh, I want to share with you my uh, my own experience. Um, as I've been said, I'm a CEO of Wafa Salaf. When I joined this company in 1988, it was just a startup. And now it's the uh, largest uh, consumer credit company in Morocco with a 30% market share. Uh, thanks to uh, our 900 hardworking employees. Um, Ofazalef opens, opens up uh, possibilities for different group of people, young people, retired, craftsmen, etc. And uh, we have able to... Um, uh, to serve more than 1.5 million customers through uh, 1,500 uh, points of sales. All this has been achieved um, on basis on strong values and commitment, uh, proximity, uh, team spirit, innovation, and transparency. And this is why we extend our uh, financial expertise to Tunisia, to Senegal, and now uh, we are working on the Côte d'Ivoire. Our mission is to promote financial, uh, financial inclusion. And what drives me, is first, is the human, uh, human element. The human cal uh, capital is very important for us, very important for our company. Uh, and the CSR, the Corporate Social uh, Responsibility, is a strategic issue for my company, and it's a strategic issue for um, our communities. It is by helping our communities, uh, by helping our people, um, that, that can uh, we all prosper. 
the CSR is uh, uh, it's, uh, include in our DNA. And uh, we are proud uh, of uh, our initiative. Uh, the first initiative is about women. Uh, in Wafasalaf, we have 53% women, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient to have just uh, more than women, but what I want is to have the women on the top management. This is why I introduced uh, 10 years ago a specific program for the women. And uh, now, uh, in the committee, in the executive committee, I have 45% uh, of, of women because they need a specific uh, training. Um, so the women issue is very important for me and uh, I'm also uh, involved uh, by promoting entrepreneurship uh, with young people and that brings uh, me to the second thing is innovation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also the CEO of the NGO, it's uh, Injaz Al Maghrib. Injaz Al Maghrib is a member of Junior Achievement Worldwide. Uh, junior Achievement Worldwide, uh, Injaz is, comes uh, from Arabic word, it means uh, progress. And our mission is to help young, the new generation of entrepreneurs emerge. The GA is about helping young people to believe themselves, to believe their uh, potential by, by enabling uh, them to create their own opportunities. And so how do, um, how do we do this? Uh, Injaz volunteers are uh, business executives. Uh, they, de they deliver a specific program for uh, junior achievements in various school, university, uh, but, but only the public, a public school, not private school. Um, and we are based on the um, learning by doing approach. The goal is, uh, is to help the strengthening links uh, between the educational and the corporate uh, world and instill a sense uh, of initiative and entrepreneurship among young people. So, what kind of uh, impact and reach uh, in, uh, in, in jazz? In jazz was founded 10 years ago. 100,000 young people have, uh, have been trained, thanks to over 3,000 uh, executive volunteers and over 90 national and international uh, partners. So it is a vast uh, network that serves as a bridge uh, between the public education system, the private sector, and its ecosystem. We work with groups of students, but we also get teachers and uh, administrators uh, involved in the, pro in the program. And this is a win-win for everyone. And uh, how, did, how did we create this incredible network? Wafa Salaf's holding SNI uh, was the very first donator, very important donator in, uh, in, uh, in jazz. And in jazz is, uh, is a powerful HR tool, um, especially when you can make community involvement a key value within your company. Every year, we have 1,000 volunteers from our group to, uh, to give back to community. I am personally started to be a volunteer at the beginning and each year I have classes, I have students and I spend two hours by, per week during five or uh, six months to help uh, the young people and to, to, uh, to see with him how they can create this, uh, uh, how they can create an, uh, an enterprise. So these volunteers, it's very important to, to understand what's the volunteer. Volunteers, they take time out of uh, their uh, busy week uh, to make a difference in their communities. The time is paid for the company uh, and it's another win-win because the, the, vol the volunteers can share their uh, business, uh, business and professional skills. Uh, it's about financial education, uh, how to create, how to innovate, how to create an enterprise. And we have many success stories. Uh, since Injaz was founded, uh, young entrepreneurs have 
created uh, over 1,000 uh, young um, junior companies. And they have all been made possible thanks to the human elements and innovation. But what I must say here, uh, uh, human elements and innovation, it's not sufficient. Because um, there is another thing that's, that has a huge importance, is the inspiration. So how can we inspire the young people? Um, uh, you don't have to be a uh, Cheryl Sandberg or uh, Elon Musk. You don't have to be uh, some kind of legend, uh, legend person to give back to the to the to the society and to um, to share an important business skill and just to share life lessons with uh, with young people. So, in jazz volunteers are there to set an example. There are not superstars, but just real life role models who inspire young people. So each of, uh, of you here uh, is exactly the kind of person who can help prepare uh, young people to succeed. It's about giving time. One of most precious what we have is the time. Many company gives us the money. It's important to give us money. I'm very happy when I receive money. But uh, giving just a few hours uh, in, um, in your time a week, uh, we can help develop the chain of solidarity. Um, we can help young people uh, to, to be motivated by school. And each of us, what, uh, what it takes to make a difference in the, in the lives of young people. So I, I encourage you to to be involved by the entrepreneurship of the young people, because really it's a, it's a change, uh, it's a change uh, definitely my uh, my life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mamou. So your message for every man and woman in this audience is to give two hours a week to a young person, and that they will be rewarded. Yeah. Two hours is like a lunch. We can okay, just... so one lunch a week to promote a young person. So Valeria Tamini, it's your turn. Um, you know young people because you're an economy teacher, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You have a mic? Okay. Yeah, I think I have. Thank you. It works? Yeah. Uh, well, let me first uh, say just a word to say that I'm so... I feel the privilege of being here in this women forum, so I thank the president. I think that Clara Geimer made a fantastic work in, well, driving us all together here. And Chiara, and just one word for the Familia Corazza, as you said, just a great family, and so much involved in this. So thank you very much for inviting me, and I think this gives us strength also, and this allow us to, def well, to make a kind of diffusion of this empowerment. So it's very important and thank you very much. So why energy? I'm here as energy commissioner. And uh, well, my idea is uh, energy, was I launched a few years ago, is energy for peace uh, and energy for prosperity, Sabine, and energy for, let's say, empowering women. And I have three points on this. The first one is, uh, well, I serve as MEDREG, Vice President, which is an association of energy regulators. Apart from the fact that the staff is 90% composed by women, females, I mean young women, and I pretend, I assume that women vision, I'm sure you agree, <laughs> has a different, kind of different angle, of course, as we all know. So the point of energy for peace, in the Mediterranean, north and south and shore, it's, it's very important because, uh, well, we have uh, what I, we call a mutual benefit for Europe and for Mediterranean south shore. Because just to say as an economist, one word, uh, well, just to synthesize at the maximum, in Europe we have an extra supply, of course, of energy, electricity, gas, etc. And uh, in the north, nor in the southern shore, we have an increasing demand. 
And this has to do with demography, just with demography, with growth, with, uh, with the difficulties uh, of the political situation. But demography helps in that sense. It's a problem, but it's an opportunity as well. And Europe must take it. So that's the first point. And just to give a, just an example for electricity, I was sitting next to uh, our friend, the Minister of Tourism of Tunisia. We just had a, a very nice uh, um, round table with the mini energy minister, who's a woman as well. Uh, you are all women in Tunisia? That's fantastic. <laughs> and, and we had a discussion, a nice discussion, because we are building a, uh, an electricity interconnector from Tunisia to Italy. I mean, just the kind of mutual exchange I'm hinting on. And then as far as, uh, so that means prosperity, employment, investment, uh, innovation also, of course. And this is for existing, for gas, so we have pipelines. And believe it or not, Europe, through Europe uh, and MEDREG, uh, the, the Association of Energy Regulators, we are building a colloquium between uh, horizontal, di uh, politically different uh, conditions uh, like Israel and Gaza and Egypt and Libya, etc., through Europe, uh, like a triangle. And this is fantastic. Uh, I think this is really corresponds to women's vision. Uh, doesn't matter what the political, it doesn't matter, it's too strong, but uh, it's less important the political uh, difficulties. We have to, to go. Uh, well, to go, to go far away on that direction. So this is just in a few pills what we consider in Madrid energy for peace and for prosperity uh, and growth. Then there is the second issue which is about the renewables. All the countries, all your countries I would say, but our countries like Italy as well, can enjoy of any very important contribution by renewables. Not only renewables, I mean sun, um, uh, well, all the kind of, not fossil fuel wind, of course, hydric is a bit more problematic, but not fossil fuels. Uh, the first part was about fossil fuels for peace. And now let us consider renewable sources for electricity and uh, transport, etc. And what about solar? I mean, solar is for the, the med South Mediterranean, is fundamental. And, uh, well, environment uh, has a fundamental improvement by renewables, but also about renewables. Uh, I have the experience uh, with the United Nations uh, of empowering women uh, through uh, while well, giving them the capacity of uh, enlightening the village uh, with little kit, very easy to use, colored kit, so you don't need to be to know well to know how to write or how to read. You just have colored like Lego, and uh, with this kit you can build. Just generally speaking, mm, I would say solar panels, and so provide the village with light. Uh, and also free yourself as a woman from the burden of, of collecting wood, etc. So this, uh, this is why renewables are a fundamental key to empower women in those little villages, giving prosperity. And last but not least, I would say the third issue is about Italy. Well, we have a tradition of culture and this is not only women, but women especially, I will not quote them, but I can quote Mattei, for instance, uh, of building bridges uh, on that. This is why energy can build bridge, as water did between Jordan and uh, Israel with enlightened people like Rabin and the king of Jordan, as we know, a peace which might last. I mean, so it did last in that occasion. So this is why we consider the tradition and the culture of bridging uh, to our cultures and uh, well the Mediterranean has been historical as we all know a fantastic pool of cultures uh, so let's go back Italy has a responsibility from that point of view and we women feel it very much indeed
So thank you for inviting me here, <laughs> and I hope we will go on. But the last thing is uh, uh, about what you said on volunteering. We have a very nice experience we had, and we still have experience in CIA, the Council of Energy Regulators, which is uh, women in energy, exactly, and is uh, a program of mentoring uh, all over the world, uh, through Skype or through any kind of internet way, we, we are connected. I'm connected with a Canadian young lady. Of course, it's volunteer, but it's very important for us, for the old ones like me and for the young ones like the, the new one. And we call it uh, Women in Energy and uh, Mentoring Women in Energy. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. And concerning energy for peace, uh, I read last week a German paper which is called Die Zeit, the leading uh, weekly, and they had an article which was published under the title Was Sun and Wind Against Putin and Trump? I know it was very well seen. Um, so, uh, if I can uh, sum up what you said, which is very optimistic, I think, is that the recent and rubber studies show that women win, men don't lose, on the contrary, and that it's important to take the weakest, uh, the, the smallest by the hand and uh, to, to mentor them to have a win-win situation. That was uh, what came out of the round table. Um, I wanted to know if, because we don't have any time for a question in the audience, which is sad, but we are very short on time, but among yourselves, do you have a question about what was said uh, by your colleagues on the panel? No? Because otherwise I have questions, but no, I prefer you. No, I just, I just wanted to say that um, in a way maybe what we should uh, take advantage of is that this backlash that, that we see in America or somewhere else, maybe this is an opportunity, it's a wake-up call to all of us because maybe we took things for granted, maybe we thought that progress is always one step ahead of the other one, but now that we see that we can go back very easily, perhaps now is the time for us to be much more even concerned about progress and, and uh, join hands everywhere around the, the globe to do that. That's true. <laughs> The Brexit, the crisis, Trump unites the good people with goodwill. Um, actually, I have a crucial question that all of you mentioned more or less. It is the young people, and Mr. Tajani mentioned the problem to the new generation, young men and young women. They've been hit by a massive unemployment, especially the ones in the south of Europe. And there is a great danger that we have a lost generation. So... Uh, Europe tried to, to do something, for instance, they triggered this so-called um, youth guarantee, which didn't really work, maybe except in Finland. So what kind of model should we offer our young people to make them have a good life and dream, maybe? So I would like to hear the four of you on that question. We begin with uh, Valeria. I didn't inform the panelists I would speak about no, young people. No, it's, it's very intriguing and very important. I think it's the question at the moment for us, for our generation, is the fundamental question, even more than women. It has to do with inequality and equality, and this is, uh, well, a generational uh, equality. We let them with, uh, in Europe uh, with a large burden, uh, debt burden, but then we must make them participate. I would say that participation can be the key, participation in projects, uh, participation in, and also, well, like for me, it's renewables environment, uh, one of my, in my work, one of the key issues in which I can make them participate and I can even learn from them because they have a vision which is completely different from our old fashioned vision. So I would say participation for, the next environment, generally speaking, of the planet. That's my point. And do you have students, Italian students, who leave Italy to work somewhere else of in course. Europe? 
Yes. Of course. No, not only in Europe, in Africa, my son, <laughs> no, but also <laughs> students, I mean. Because of uh, joblessness? Or no, 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 just because of uh, volunteering in villages for, for a few months and then they come back. So the point is how to build bridges uh, among them because young people have no problems at all, I mean, less than us, in building bridges and in helping each other and building together, I mean, they're more global. And this is, of course, it's a problem, as we all know, especially in the Mediterranean, but it's an opportunity. So I don't think that the problem is only our, let me say, not only the European unemployment, it's the exchange, the global exchange of youth and the next generation is fundamental. Because I was mentioning that because in Italy and even more in Greece, you have the impression that there is a kind of brain drain, an exodus of young people. And for instance, in Germany, you have a big company, which is Deutsche Bahn, so dealing with uh, trains, the French SNCF, like the French SNCF. Each year, the, uh, the human director, resources director, goes to Greece, goes to Italy to hire young people. So it's interesting, but it's in a way very, very troubling. Yeah, it, it, it's good just to say that because um, uh, it, it will not be a model for Europe to organize the transit, massive transit of the southern youth to the northern countries. Huh? It will not work. If we, if we think it could be the solution, it's not going to be the case, it will be the explosion of Europe, and very violent. So we need to create jobs in those countries, starting from France. The problems of the different countries are different. In France, we have had, uh, in the past 25 years, a very specific psychological problem, which is that the people in responsibility, let's say the, the elderly, the 40s, the 50 year old, the 60 year old, all, all the people who are, you know, holding the reins. They, I have to say it, they lost a little bit of their sense of responsibility. When I define responsibility by the duty to be creative, optimistic, and to invest. If I am pessimistic, if I don't want to invest, if I think it's the end of the world, uh, no wonder my children are unemployed. So the, the duty of the elite is to invest. And when there is strictly no banking problem, no capital problem whatsoever, and you see people not investing just because they have the sort of laziness of pessimism, you have to fight. Or maybe because they are afraid. Yeah, but uh, you know, when you are a leader, you must not be afraid. Or you're not a leader and, and, and go away. I'm in my room of journalists. <laughs> so, uh -huh. But when you say lazy... So, uh, no, but you know, th uh, this is what we have been living through. I think now it's starting to be over. There is, a, there is a reversal of values at last. But it lasted 25 years. In, in, in Italy, it's different. In Italy, you really have a big banking problem. So the rest of Europe needs to be solider to Italy and help the, the, the fast rebuilding of a banking system so that the entrepreneurs can, can you know, take uh, loans and really invest for the youth. I mean, today there was a, a massive investment of 21 billion euros in, in Italian uh, crippled banks. So the crisis is not over. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, the level of investment in Italy is not where it should be for the youth. So here, I, 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 I recommend European solidarity and not transfer demographic transfers of people from the south to the north. I'm sorry, I will have to be very quick with the two of you, but it's interesting because you're not Europeans, so you have an outside view, so it's very interesting. I'm sorry, the lady in, in blue told me we have to hurry, so if you can sum up your response. I'm sorry. Yeah, just to, in Morocco, we have an employment rate, especially in the young people. This is why we decide to, to work uh, about entrepreneurship, because 75% of the young people, they want to be just a salary. It's impossible. This is why we, uh, we try to, 
to help them to create their enterprise. And we have a specific a program to, um, to help the, the young people to create uh, their, uh, their own uh, enterprise. And uh, we have a pre-incubator and uh, incubator. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, every year we have, uh, like, like, uh, like I said, a specific uh, mentor to, uh, to help these young people. So it's important to have uh, more than startup because um, the salary is, um, it's can, uh, it can be impossible to, um, uh, to recruit. Or uh, we have one, 140,000 people every, every year, they, uh, they're looking for salary, it's impossible. So we have to, to, to work with them to, to, uh, to push them to create their own enterprise. Can I ask That's you for a brief. quick, yes. <laughs> sorry. Does it work? Uh, I'll be very brief in the sense that I think we have the world is facing two problems. One is, of course, youth unemployment. Every country thinks that they have, you know, the youth unemployment is their problem, but it's global uh, and so on. The other one is radicalism and, and uh, terrorism, and in a way they are interrelated. I think that this is a, the, the, the age of disruption. The young generation, the millennials, and I have two of them at home, uh, they should not be expecting anymore to have a job waiting for them. They have to create their own opportunities to be, and what policymakers need to do is to create an environment for them to create their own opportunities. The second point that I want to make very briefly, and my, I, I, I look to Europe to do that, is that with, uh, with you know, the environment in, in, in the United States, and I live 10 minutes away from the White House, so I, you can imagine how close I am to, to, this, to this thing, is that we need to understand that when we create conflicts in other parts of the world, this is not going to stay in that part of the world. It's going to come home, and the chickens are going to come home to roost. So therefore, let's be careful. And I'm so happy that Europe is standing up to, to this issue. And I really salute you. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that we don't create more conflicts around the world, because in one way or the other, our children will pay for it. Europe standing up. At, at, I have one more, you say Europe is standing up, one more, f it's from Angela Merkel. So, you say her Europe is standing up, there is a new wind blowing, and I will quote to finish Angela Merkel, never forget, so last week at the European Council, never forget the European Union is based on common values, which are the most precious values. So, thank you for listening.